Well, good morning, and good morning to all those that are joining us on our internet broadcast this morning. We are glad that you are here. Today we're going to finish up on our series on how to make a change in your life if you're looking for a change. And we're, we're finishing up with a message entitled, <clears throat> Get Ready. That's right, to get ready. And today we're going to uh, learn about the three P's of getting ready. Uh, we need to prepare ourselves. We need to have patience after that. And, and then we need to have perseverance. And today we're going to learn that how to prepare, how to have patience, and how to have perseverance. Well, today we come from Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. And if we were to study, actually, the wedding customs of all things throughout the world and throughout history, we'd find a kind of a rich and interesting variety of ways to what they say, tie the knot. Uh, to the Western mind, many of the customs that we would encounter would appear quite strange to us compared to the way we do things. And in the parable that we're going to read this morning, <clears throat> Jesus actually refers to some customs that were in, common in his day and actually are still common today in modern Palestine. So let me give you a little background on these customs before we read the parable. Uh, there was a doctor named Alexander Findlay, and he tells of what he himself saw in Palestine just some years ago. He said, when we were approaching the gates of the uh, Galilean town, he said, I caught sight of these ten maidens, uh, gaily clad and playing some kind of musical instruments as they danced along in the road in front of our car. And he says, I asked what they were doing, and the interpreter told me that they were going to keep the bride company till her bridegroom arrived. So I asked the interpreter again if there was any chance of seeing the wedding. Uh, but he shook his head, saying, in effect, well, it might be tonight, it might be tomorrow night. Nobody really knows for sure when the wedding's going to take place. And then he went on to explain that one of the great things to do, if you could, was to catch the bridal party actually napping because they were sometimes there for days preparing, getting ready for the wedding. And he said the bridegroom comes unexpectedly and sometimes in the middle of the night. And he's required by public opinion to send a man along the street to shout, Behold, behold, the bridegroom is coming. He said, but that may happen at any time, so the bridal party has to be ready no matter what time of day or night the wedding's going to take place. And they hang out in the street at all hours to meet him whenever he chooses to come. Now, another important point is that no one is allowed on the streets after dark without a lighted lamp. And also, when the bridegroom has arrived and the door has been closed to where the wedding is going to take place, latecomers to the ceremony are not admitted. If you didn't get there on time, you're out of luck. So you say, okay, well, pastor, we know all about the wedding in Palestine, but what has that got to do with the message we're talking about today? Well, I'm glad you asked. So let's look at the actual scripture from Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 1. It says, The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of the ten bridesmaids who took their lamps <clears throat> and went to meet the bridegroom. Sound familiar? Still happening today. Verse 2, five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough oil for their lamps. So they burned oil in the lamps in those days. But the other five were wise enough to take some extra oil along because, of course, they didn't know how long it was going to be before the bridegroom came. Verse 5, when the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. And all the bridegrooms got up and prepared their lamps. Verse 8. It says, Then the five foolish ones asked the other ones, Gee, gee, we ran out of, we ran out of oil. Can we have some of your oil? Because we're, our lamps are going out. Verse 9. But the other said, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was then locked. Verse 11. 
Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. So Jesus tells this story really to illustrate the need for us to be ready when he returns for the final time in order to take those who have trusted him into heaven. And today I want to share with you the three necessary attributes, if you will, for readiness that Jesus teaches in this story. I like to call them the three P's of being ready. Now, number one is preparation. Preparation. Really, it's the key to success to life, isn't it? It's the key to success in every area of our lives. When we're prepared for a task, we can usually do it, right? When you're prepared for a test in school, you, you study the, the text and so forth, so when the teacher gives you the test, you're prepared. When you go for a job interview, you, you get your act together, all your information, so that when they ask you questions, you're prepared. When I was a police officer, I had the five, what we call the five P's of survival taped to my locker door. It means prior planning prevents poor performance. And you don't want to have poor performance in the field when you're a policeman because you can end up dead. So prior planning prevents poor performance. The same goes through life, doesn't it? Prior planning in life prevents you doing a lousy job. And especially true when it comes to preparing, amen, for Christ to come back. Now, there are three truths concerning preparing that we would well to do to understand. And we learn it from the parable that Jesus told us. Number one, there's a point when it's too late. There's a point when it's too late. You can prepare all you want and keep, but if you don't do some action, right, it's too late. Three phrases in this parable really help to illustrate the point. Number one, the bridesmaids were, that were unprepared hear the cry of the bridegroom is on his way, and they're not ready to meet him. They said, our lamps are going out. In verse 8, our lamps are going out, right? Then they run to buy some more oil for their lamps, but by the time they return, the bridegroom has already arrived to the marriage feast, and they are shut out. Verse 10 says, the door, the door was locked. And then finally, the foolish bridemaids began calling to the groom, asking him to open the door and let them into the wedding feast. But what's this reply in verse 12? I don't know you. I don't know you. You're not getting in here. These three phrases describe the situation of those who have not prepared themselves for the return of Jesus Christ. They realize that they have not prepared for his coming, and then now they, they desire to come into his presence, but what? It's too late, isn't it? It's too late. There are certain things that can't wait until the last minute. We can't hope to pass a test if we begin studying 15 minutes before the test, right? We can't acquire the skills necessary to perform a job until the day we're hired. We can't wait until that day, right? We have to know when the boss puts us to work, he wants to know that we can do the job. We can't prepare ourselves to meet God after he has already come back and taken everybody. There's a point when it's too late, amen? The next truth about preparation is there is no reason to delay. There is no reason to de delay. And I respect and appreciate the need to be sure of a decision that we make for Christ, right? And I have no problem with someone investigating the facts of Christianity, checking it out, make sure that Jesus is who he claimed to be. <clears throat> in fact, I think it should be done. But there comes to a point in time where the investigation stage ends, amen, and the point of trusting begins. You can't always research something and never do what you're researching, right? Never buy the product or make the decision to go somewhere. At some point, your research has to end and some action has to take place. So once you're convinced that Jesus is God in the flesh, that he died in your place, and that he rose from the dead, there's no reason to delay the decision to turn your life over to him. 
Let's look at Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. For God says, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of your salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is when? Is now. <clears throat> Today is what? The day of salvation. <clears throat> you see, the foolish bridesmaid had every opportunity to be prepared. <clears throat> there was no reason for them to wait until the bridegroom arrived. So the same is true for us, isn't it? Once we know who Jesus is, isn't it time to turn our lives over to him? There's no reason to delay because there are no second chances. <clears throat> the third truth about preparation is there's a decision that needs to be made. We got to make a decision. <clears throat> Either Jesus is who he claims to be, right? Or he isn't. He, he either is God in the flesh that came to earth to die in our place, or he's a phony. If he's a phony, there's, there's no decision to make, right? Right? Go on with our lives the way we were going without him. Oh, but, but what if Jesus is who he claims to be? And I'm convinced that he is, that we need to either accept him <clears throat> or reject him. And if you're convinced that Jesus is who he claims to be, let, let me recommend to you that you make the decision to turn your life over to him before he comes back. And we don't know when that is, right? So as soon as we're convinced, we need to make a decision. John 12 and 36 says, Put your trust in the light while there is what? Still time. <clears throat> then you will become children of the light. After saying these things, Jesus went away and was hidden from them. Now look in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, and what does it tell us? If we confess with what? With our mouth that Jesus is what? Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be what? Saved. It's easy, isn't it? <clears throat> All we got to do is confess with our mouth. We don't have to do anything else. Just believe that he is who he says he is. And what happens? We will be what? We will be saved. It says verse 10. For it is by believing in your heart, <clears throat> truly believing, that you are made right with God. And it is by confessing with your mouth that you are what? That you are saved. Are you ready to make that kind of decision? Decision to confess that Jesus is Lord of your life? Are you ready to be baptized into his name? <clears throat> Let's look at Romans chapter 6, verse 4. It says, For we what? We died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now also we may what? L live new lives. If we haven't made the decision yet, I implore you to make the decision for Christ and make it today. Now the rest of the message today is aimed towards those that have already made the decision for Christ, those who are classified as the quote-unquote wise bridesmaids, right, in the story. Well, the wise bridesmaids are those who were prepared, right? They made a decision for Christ, those who were invited into the marriage feast. Now, we, while we wait for Jesus to return, the next two things we're going to speak about are necessary for those that are already believers. This, the next thing is we have to have patience. We have to have patience. We prepared, but we can't be impatient. <clears throat> we have to have patience. And for me, I always love it when I have to preach on patience because it's mostly a sermon really for me because I'm a get-it-done type person. I'm not the kind of person that likes to wait for anything. But when it comes to the return of Christ, I realize it's something that not only I have to do, but everyone has to do because we don't know when he is coming. So the first truth about patience is Jesus' return it's a sure thing. It's a sure thing. There's no doubt that the bridegroom, Jesus, is on his way. Never does Jesus say, if I come, right? It's always when I come. When I come. 
when I come. As surely as Jesus came the first time, he'll come the second time for his bride, the church, which he brought with his own blood. Let's look at Acts chapter 1, verses 11. Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday, what? He will return from heaven in the same way that you saw him go. He's coming back. Yes, he is. You can take that to the spiritual bank, right? Jesus' return is sure. What else? Jesus' timing, though, <clears throat> is unknown. We don't know when he's coming back. There's no doubt that Jesus will return, but we have no idea when that's going to take place. <clears throat> and if you're into trying to figure out the time of Jesus' return, like some folks try to do, and they actually think they know it, but they don't, let me save everybody some time. Take every book and magazine that tries to tell you that this is going to happen at a certain time. Throw them in the trash because nobody knows. God's book is the only book that counts. And he says, you don't know when he's coming back. Every time there's a conflict in the Middle East, our modern day false prophets start predicting it's the end time. Matthew 25 and 13 tells us what? <clears throat> so you too must keep watch. For you do not know the day or the hour of my return. <clears throat> Second Peter 3 and 10. But the day the Lord will come as unexpectedly as the thief. Wow. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear into fire. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Now, I don't want to bust anybody's bubble here, but if anybody tells you they know when Jesus is going to return, even the season of his return, they don't know what they're talking about. Amen? <clears throat> There's no signs to look for, for there are no events that would have to take place before he can come. Jesus' word to us is, <clears throat> be patient, I will come, but you don't know when that's going to be. He could return today. Or he can return 10,000 years from now. He will come when he comes. <clears throat> like they say, it is what it is. And there's nothing anybody can do to change that. The third truth about patience is Jesus' promise is true. It's something we can rely on. Matthew 28 and 30 says, Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, Jesus says. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He left, when he left, he left at the Holy Spirit within each believer so that he would be what? He would be with us even until the end of the age. And his promise is not only to his original disciples, it's to all who follow in their footsteps. The promise is to be with us as our companion for the future. Amen. And while we're waiting for Jesus to return for the final time, really we recognize he's already here with us right now. Amen? It's not just that Jesus is with us in the sense of I'll be thinking about you. He's really with us just as we are with each other today. His second coming is simply a final realization, amen, of his promise. The third necessary attribute of readiness is perseverance perseverance. You see, when we make a decision to follow Christ as our Lord, we're doing it really for the long haul, so to speak. We're not in this for just a, the short-term thing. We're in it to win it, right? We're in it to win it. Now, as we've just seen, we don't know when Jesus will return. So what do we do while we're waiting for him to come? What do we, what do, we do? Well, as we wait, we do what? We worship him. When we make a decision for Christ, it's an act of worship. When Christ returns, we're going to worship him forever, right? So in the meantime, we might as well start worshiping him right now. Hebrews 12 and 28 says, Since we are what? Receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be what? Thankful and please God by doing what? How do we please God? The Bible says, by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. 
that's the main reason we're gathered here today. In the light of the coming kingdom, we gather together as saints of God and offer him praise. Guess what? That's why we call this a worship service. As we sing to him, as we pray to him, as we live for him, as we look forward to that great anticipation of the day when we're going to be just like him, we worship him in the meantime. We don't begin worshiping God after we get to heaven. No, we're simply continuing on the practice that we've participated in together as we waited for that glorious day. When we worship God in this assembly, it's an acknowledgement that we believe by what? By faith that Jesus is coming again. Now, as we wait, what else do we do? We work. We work. That's right. While we're waiting, Jesus has given us the gift of his church. We're continuing following the instructions of Christ to work in the kingdom today for what? For the blessings of the kingdom that's yet to come. We work together as the eyes, the hands, and the heart of Christ, reaching out in compassion, amen, to the world that's around us. We equip each other to in the work of ministry, amen, and we assist each other in living out our purpose, which is the will of God. We think, we act, we sweat together, right? Why do we do this? For the cause of Christ, as we look forward to that great day that Jesus has promised us. What else do we do while we, while we wait? We work, right? We also witness. Very important, isn't it? The last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples were what? Words of witness. Before he ascended into heaven with the promise of his returning on his lips, Jesus said these departing words found in Acts verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 8. It says, but you will what? Receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will do what? Be my witnesses, telling people where? where? About me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and where else? To the ends of the earth. When Jesus left, he empowered us. When we accept him as Lord and Savior, he empowers us with the power of the Holy Spirit. And what does he want us to do with that? It says he wants us to be his witness, telling people about him everywhere. Sometimes people view a person's parting words as words of importance. And Jesus knew that his last words would be held in the highest regard throughout all history. He chose the words to be the words that stress the importance of being his witness. So while we wait for his return, the most important thing we can do above everything else is what? To tell other people about Christ who is coming once again. You see, brothers and sisters, it's our job to turn those foolish bridesmaids into wise ones so that they will be ready, amen, when Jesus comes back. He, he clearly told us what our job is, right? Right? But how often do we answer Jesus by saying, you know, Jesus, boy, I love this job that you gave me. I love this job. And today I believe that we have a greater opportunity to fulfill that command of Jesus than any other time in history. People are ready to hear a message of Jesus Christ. The, the, the question is, are we ready to tell them? Now today I spoke about preparation and, and patience and perseverance, and these things are all necessary if we're going to live as people ready for Christ's return. We prepare. How do we prepare? By trusting Christ for salvation. We display patience by living in the knowledge that everything Jesus said will happen. And we persevere by simply being the people that God called us to be. Are you a sleeping bridesmaid today? Is your lamp out of oil? Are you ready for the bridegroom? There's a point when it's too late, I tell you. There's, a, there's, a, there's no reason to delay. There's a decision that needs to be made. It's time to get ready. Don't we get ready for, for dates and for work and for hurricanes, right, for floods? We get ready for church. We get ready for almost everything in life, don't we? But do we... 
get ready for eternal life? Don't we think that's kind of important, huh? We don't know when our opportunity for eternal life will come, but it's time to get ready for it now before it's too late. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're coming back for us. We thank you that you left instructions for us that while you were gone, these are the things that we need to do. You didn't leave it for us to try to figure out all by ourselves. And not only did you leave the instruction, but you left your spirit, the Holy Spirit within us to be with us so we wouldn't have to go through this alone. You left him here to protect us, to guide us, and to direct us. Open our hearts and minds to the Spirit's leading so that we will be the wise bridesmaids. But you also left us with a challenge and a task that needs to be done. You told us to go out and seek those foolish bridesmaids, those who don't know you, to tell them how to be prepared, to tell them how to persevere and, and how to do what you instructed us to do. Don't let us go through this life without being the true workers for the kingdom that you intended us to be. Help us not to be selfish with our salvation. Help us to let others know that why we are saved and what we believe. We know that we can't change them, we can't make them believe, but we can introduce them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all you asked us to do. And we can pray that once we give them the introduction that we pray that the Holy Spirit will touch their hearts and minds to seek you out, Lord, so that they too can make a change in their lives and be successful not only in this life, but the life that's everlasting. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.